Thank you so much for that very, very warm welcome. Uh, it's great to be back at Duke. Ten is a wonderful age. Um, you survived. You might have kept your parents up at night. You've given them tremendous joy and satisfaction. But now it's time for adolescence. A friend of mine said to me, small children, small problems, big children, big problems. <laughs> That's where you are now. I was very grateful to the Institute for sending me a pack summarizing your strategy, your past, your present, your future. And I noticed that the strategy you have at the moment ends in 2017. So I thought it'd be kind of fun if we spent some time writing a new strategy for the Duke Global Health Institute this afternoon in 30 minutes. So let's do that. Let's look at the world and let's write a new future for the Institute. You couldn't start from a better place than Chairman Mao. One of his most influential essays that he wrote was in 1937. It was called On Contradiction. And he said this, development arises from the contradictions inside a thing. And I don't know a better way of describing the world today than to say that it is a world of contradictions. We talk glibly about development, but we live in a world of dislocation. It's true that we've taken over two billion people out of poverty during the past 30 years, but we've replaced that with pervasive and deepening inequalities. We believe in multilateralism, the cooperation between nation states, and yet we are going through a period of populist nationalism with the rise of right-wing political parties that, that are destroying any notion of cooperation between nations. We say we're committed to the idea of universal human rights, and yet we find reasons to accept ourselves from that notion of universalism. We also commit ourselves to believing in the power of democracy and liberty. Yet we see many countries implementing policies that reflect authoritarianism and increasing control. In the world that I live in, I have a great concern about the diminution of freedom of expression in many, many countries today. We, particularly in this audience, are committed to the importance, the power of knowledge and a 300-year-old idea which still burns bright in our minds of enlightenment. And yet, we see increasingly the forces of anti-knowledge and violence. In the New York Times today, you will have read about the latest Pew Research findings on belief or non-belief in the science of climate change in this country. Still, a large proportion of the population do not believe in the science of climate change, and we see the endemic crises in our democracies that flow from this lack of trust. We need a global world order in which to deliver the hopes that we have for our future. And yet, repeatedly, we see shocks that overtake those hopes and plunge us into chaos and discontinuity. What is the solution? The solution that is on offer are the Sustainable Development Goals. On the left, the 17 goals. On the right, the specific targets within SDG 3 on health. But I believe the truth is that we as a community have failed to understand the true meaning of sustainability. We're still in the mode of thinking that was the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. What is sustainability? Let's look at the idea of sustainable development. First, we all know that it is 
about a universal concept of human improvement. But it's also about believing that the future generations on our planet are as important as our generation, intergenerational equity. It's about the oneness of life. It's not saying that human life is more important than any other life. It's saying that all life is important and interdependent. It's talking about the symbiosis between not just that one life, but those natural systems and the physical systems of our planet. And it's saying, it's saying that the way we construct our societies, our political, our economic, our social, our technological systems will determine much of the future of that concept of sustainable development. Now, what is the progress towards the sustainable development goals? Well, we've only just got going, so it's a little bit fair, unfair to uh, write a report card. But we published a report card two weeks ago from Chris Murray's group at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. 17 goals, 169 targets, 230 indicators. So how are we doing? Well, Hans Rosling has, for many years, articulated the idea that this notion of, de of a developed and a developing world is wrong. And what this report card on the SDG shown is how true Hans was in his advocacy for one world. If you plot a measure of the secular trend of improvement in countries, which is called here the socio demographic index, a combined measure of wealth, fertility reduction, and educational improvement against an SDG index, which is an index taking the non-MDG and the MDG-related health indicators across the SDGs together, what you get is approximately a straight line, in other words, a continuum. Now, there is enormous variation between countries. And some countries are doing better in their SDG metrics given their particular level of wealth, fertility, reduction, and education. You can see here that Spain, Morocco, and Uruguay are doing better than expected. But America has a lot in common with Russia, as we know from one presidential candidate, <laughs> but not in the way that he articulates. America and Russia are underperforming in terms of their sustainable development. And that should be a concern, a political concern, especially in an election year. So what is the progress? If you look on the right-hand side of that figure, you see that we are doing quite well in terms of our progress towards universal health coverage, access to modern contraception, and measures of hygiene, and less well in areas such as childhood underweight. Let's take a couple of case studies. Let's take maternal health to begin with. While we have done a great job as a global community, seriously we have, what you're looking at here is comparisons between 1990 and 2013 across the major causes of maternal mortality. This series led by colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, presented two weeks ago at the United Nations General Assembly. And you can see for abortion, hemorrhage, hypertension, obstructed labor, sepsis, and other causes, reductions over that time course, an impressive improvement. We know we've succeeded. We also know what the causes of maternal death are. We know the importance of sepsis, the complications of unsafe abortion, hemorrhage, infectious causes, hypertensive disorders, and so on. That we do understand. And we know what it will take to reduce maternal mortality further, which is moving towards facility-based health care with basic and, in places, comprehensive emergency obstetric care. We know all this. But we are not doing well. 
This is Una Campbell who led that series. There are today 53 million women in the world who have zero, not just poor, but zero access to maternal health care. 53 million women is a stunning and shocking figure. Now, I believe, like Gavin believes, in the opportunity of a grand convergence. But the reality is today that we are seeing a grand divergence. If you take the 10 highest maternal mortality, mortality ratio countries and the 10 lowest maternal mortality ratio countries, and you divide one by the other, what you see over time is that red line. An increasing divergence between those two extreme groupings. So if we are really going to be the convergence generation, business as usual is not good enough. We have to change the way we work. We have to have an inflection in the trajectory of our so-called progress. Here is the United States of America again. Why is this not an election issue? Maternal mortality in the United States consistently over the last decade or so has been rising. It's scandalous, outrageous, unacceptable, and should be on the front page of every newspaper and a central issue in your election campaign. I fell asleep, sadly, mainly through jet lag, in the middle of the vice presidential debate last night, sitting on my bed in the hotel near here. But why wasn't maternal mortality raised as, a, as an issue that is unacceptable for the world's one and only superpower? California did better until recently. Let's take a second case study, adolescent health. There are 1.8 billion young people on our planet today. That is the opportunity for the future. 1.8 billion people who embody that prospect of enlightenment and progress. And the dividend that comes from investing in those 1.8 billion young people is astonishing. Healthy adolescents, yes, but also, of course, then healthy adults and in that circle of life, healthy children. A triple dividend by investing in young people. But when we look at the predicaments that young people face today, they have never been more complex, diverse, and troubling. You can divide the world into three groups where these young people live. Those who live in what can be called multi-burden countries, and this work came from a commission we published in May this year, led by George Patton from the University of Melbourne. In those multi-burden country, country, multi countries, young people are facing the predicaments of infectious disease, undernutrition, HIV, and sexual reproductive health-related problems, a kind of classical collection of issues that we know well in global health. But then in a group of countries that the commission termed injury excess, the predominant threat is violence and unintentional injuries. And then in a group of countries which are in, in terms of their development, perhaps a little bit further up on that continuum that I showed you earlier for the social uh, and economic development related to the SDG progress, a whole collection of physical disorders, mental health disorders, and substance use disorders. Young people face unprecedented challenges, and yet those young people sit at the very center of our future. The adolescent is the face of sustainable development. The young person is the opportunity for a sustainable future. But we in global health have missed that opportunity. We have failed to see the centrality of adolescence. We've set, failed to see the opportunity for young people. And as you can see here, the connection between child survival early child development and older age and the opportunities of older age 
the adolescent sits right at the heart of that. So let's briefly pause and summarize what we've said so far. First, the threats that we face to our future are existential. Our successes, and there have been successes, let me be very clear about that, but those successes also hide fearful contradictions. The SDGs are indeed inspiring and motivating, and yet our predicaments are dynamic. They are constantly changing, and we have to adapt to those changes. Yes, global health science does offer us solutions. But global health science also reveals the terrifying, truly terrifying extent of our uncertainty. And please, this is the central point I wish to make this afternoon. Sustainable development is about much more than global health. And that is why we have to rewrite the future for global health in the next 15 minutes. What's our chief challenge? Hubris. Overconfidence. Believing that we have the answers to solve many of the problems that we face. And yes, you're right. I did come away from the United Nations General Assembly feeling that we had not understood fully the challenge of sustainability and the radical transformation we need in global health to address some of those predicaments. The hubris comes from the same picture I showed earlier, the opportunity of the SDGs. Why? Because we have 17 goals, 17 silos, which is going to encourage more verticality in our global systems and potentially less integration and communication between those silos. We're not going to solve sustainable development by addressing those individual goals. Sustainable development will be won at the intersection between those goals. We're not going to achieve health without thinking about the contribution that education makes to health. We're not going to solve the challenges of ensuring healthy lives unless we make gender equity a central part of what we mean by health. We're not going to achieve health for all unless we consider the rule of law, peace and justice as essential elements in winning that vision for health in the future. Let me take one example. SDG 3, health, and SDG 8, economic growth. This is the official picture of Francois Hollande and President Jacob Zuma as they led the Commission on Health, Employment, and Economic Growth that was launched earlier this year and released during the week of the United Nations General Assembly. And I had the privilege to serve as the chair of the expert group to this commission. That's the unofficial photograph that I took at the first meeting we had in Lyon. Um, both very engaged heads of state, I must say, although for this first two-hour meeting, President Hollande spent most of it on his mobile phone. But he was there for the two hours, and that was, that was very good. We all know, we all know that investing in health, and Gavin summarized this admirably at the beginning of the day, we know that investing in health has enormous payoffs for economic growth. Investing in child health, investing in occupational health, investing in health throughout the life course will yield a higher GDP per capita. But what the evidence now shows is that investing in health employment, and I'm not talking about doctors only here, I'm talking about nurses, midwives, community-based health workers, all of those who work in and around the health sector through a whole series of pathways, whether they be through health directly, through improved economic output, better social protection, building social solidarity, through innovation, or through strengthening human security, those can all lead to greater economic growth. 
So now we have the evidence to give to finance ministers even better than we had before that health employment can be a catalyst for wealth creation. So Presidents Hollande and Zuma left Lyon. They went to the United Nations. I like that particular picture because when you take a picture of the UN building on its side rather from the, than the front, it shows you the fragility, the thinness of multilateralism. They launched their report, Working for Health and Growth, and then they had a party afterwards. And there's Margaret Chan at the center uh, launching that report. There's a summit that takes place in December this year to talk about the implementation of these findings to try and kick-start ministries of finance investing in health employment as a counter-cyclical measure to protect economic security during times of economic downturn and to provide a platform for stronger economic growth. But let me come back to this word hubris and why global health needs to change in the future. And the great opportunity I believe exists for this institution. This is Mary Midgley, a philosopher in the United Kingdom. Hubris calls for nemesis, she wrote, and in one form or another it's going to get it, but not as a punishment from outside, but as the completion of a pattern already started. And that pattern, of course, we know about. How many of you have been to see the movie Ice Age, or the movies Ice Age? I'm sure lots of you. I certainly have. They're great movies. And I'm sure you know all about the history of the Pleistocene, the Ice Age. About two and a half million years ago, the Ice Age started. It went on for a couple of million years to about 11,700 years ago. And then when the Ice Age ended, the sea level rose about 120 meters. At that stage, there were two million human beings on our planet. The end of the Pleistocene marks the beginning of our modern era, the Holocene, which we have been living through for the past 11,700 years. And as you can see here, for most of that time, those blocks show pretty much not much happened, flat lines. But then something did happen. Something did happen during the last 250 or so years. We started producing stuff. A combination of popula population growth, technological development, consumption, drove these changes that we see. And in particular, since 1950, a period that we are now in called the Great Acceleration. This era, which has been proposed to be called the Anthropocene, was very recently, just at the end of August, suggested by an official Anthropocene working group to be marked by a particular date. July the 16th, in fact, 1945, was the moment when the atomic device Trinity was exploded in New Mexico. Just a few years later, in 1951, plutonium started to be deposited in the soil and began its steady decay through the isotopes of uranium and eventually to lead. And that layer of radioactivity is now the new marker for a new human epoch, the Anthropocene. The Pleistocene through the Holocene to the Anthropocene is where we sit today. People argue about whether the Anthropocene is having any effect on the human species. Well, we can argue. But what we do know is that it's having a profound effect on biodiversity, on other species. So profound that the evidence is very clear that we are already in the middle of a sixth mass extinction of species on our planet. Biodiversity 
is a massively neglected contributor to human health. The less biodiverse our environment, the weaker are our ecosystems that support our species. Biodiversity must be, must be, if we believe in sustainability, part of a new vision for global health and all of the determinants that surround biodiversity. So let's ask ourselves, what should be the response of global health to this new human epoch? Well, some of you will have heard me talk about this before, and Subrendo is in the audience. Subrendo was part of our Planetary Health Commission. And that's what I'm just going to spend a few moments talking about. Several years ago, some colleagues of mine and myself wrote what we called a manifesto for moving from public health to planetary health. What did we mean by planetary health? People laughed when we said that. We talked about an urgent transformation that was required in our values and our practices based on the recognition of our interdependence and the interconnectedness of the risks we face. I was very grateful to the Rockefeller Foundation for investing in this idea and setting up the Commission on Planetary Health. And to cut quite a long story short, the definition of planetary health is to look at this. The health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. Not just looking as medicine does at individual level health. Not looking as public health does at population level health. But looking at the health of our civilizations. The way we organize our political, economic, social, environmental, technological systems to address the predicaments we face. We identified three challenges in this commission. A challenge to our imagination, to rethink the idea of prosperity beyond money and wealth in the conventional sense, and thinking much more about the capital around us in our environment, our societies, and elsewhere. A challenge to knowledge. What kind of knowledge do we need to address the predicaments we face in the context of one humanity? And finally, the problem of acting, a challenge to implementation, where again, we talk about implementation and implementation science, but nobody honestly has been ever able to tell me what it is I would hold in my hand if I really had implementation science actually done. So let's finish. What is the Duke strategy? This is the Duke strategy. A worldwide leader in interdisciplinary education, conducting innovative research, responding to the global burden of disease and influences policies, creating a robust network of international partners to exchange global health knowledge and skills. I've touched on some areas that I think could begin to be clues about what the next strategy might examine. But let me just take one. Let's take the Duke strategy 2.0. And I want to take three words out of that. Interdisciplinary, which is a particular strength at Duke, research, and partnerships. If we're really going to achieve the prospects that sustainable development offers us, we have to think about how we unite different disciplines to answer research questions in ways that we've never done before. Our academic reward systems, the way we fund research, the way we publish research, are not geared well to support that kind of interdisciplinary research. So how well prepared are we for this new strategy that we've just written for this institution? We're not in a good place. Work that was published just a few weeks ago in Nature showed how badly placed we are. This is work done through the Australian university system. It's measuring an index of interdisciplinarity on the x-axis and the proportion of funded proposals on the y-axis. And there's a beautiful correlation. But it's in the wrong way! 
The more interdisciplinary research you do, the less chance you have of getting it funded. And this isn't only an Australian problem, please. It's a problem worldwide. So we have to change this system somehow. I do admire Duke, particularly Duke University Press, because they're publishing journals such as this one in the Environmental Humanities, which are bringing disciplines together to address these questions. And I think your new Humanities Lab is a fantastic opportunity to achieve this. I finish here. This is the sculpture that you see immediately outside the United Nations building in New York City. The threats we face, they're serious, very serious indeed. But I do believe that global health is the science for humanity, and the opportunities that it gives us are enormous. But for that opportunity to be fully achieved, we have to revision, revise, radically transform the meaning of global health today, otherwise we will miss the opportunity, the prize that sits before us. I can't think of an institution that's better placed to seize that prize than Duke. But you, to have the courage now, to have the courage to take that radical step into a different future is going to take brave leadership. And I wish you well. Thank you very much. So my colleagues, our plan is written. We don't have to write the strategic plan. Uh, thank you, Richard. Wonderful, wonderful remarks. Really a lot to think about. We have 15 minutes uh, before we have to move upstairs for a reception, and Diana has to we have to prepare this for another event. So let's use the 15 minutes to challenge Richard. No questions on Brexit, though. That's the <laughs> one thing. Uh, anything else is OK. Please. Yes, go ahead. Just identify yourself so he has an idea where you're from. I'm Jeffrey Moe. I'm on the faculty here at the Duke Global Health Institute. So I'm not trying to back you into a question about Brexit, but I'm interested <laughs> in global trade. Uh, we, in, our, in, in our current election, uh, both of our candidates are walking away from a global trade. I'm very interested to know what your own thought about that in terms of this redefinition of prosperity. Okay. Uh, well, um, I think that we've, I mean, these arguments about uh, uh, treaties like the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, and so on have become, um, have come to dominate much of our discussion. But I, the way I would answer that is to bring it back down to the community level. Um, the whole protest against globalization um, and the Occupy movement, for example. Um, I understand that, but globalization is a force of our times and it's not going to disappear. The challenge is how to make globalization inclusive for everybody. And what we saw in the United Kingdom with Brexit, what we're seeing in your presidential debate, what we're seeing with the rise of the AFD in Germany, with the rise of Marine Le Pen in France, um, what we're seeing across much of Western Europe, in fact, with this popular right-wing nationalism, is a reaction to the fact that there is a rage against the global. And what I mean by that rage against the global is a little bit the question I was putting in one of the earlier sessions, that there is a very large part of our population now who feels socially excluded from the benefits that many of us have enjoyed. And we seem to have no political answer to that exclusion. Uh, indeed, quite the opposite. We, uh, we seem to be utterly paralyzed in the face of a divided society. So, in answer specifically to your question on trade, um, and then I would like to bring it back to uh, our responsibility, I, I respected the response of your president 
uh, very much to his vision of what the university could do. But I think I would hope for a little bit more, personally. Um, personally, I see the university um, as much more than a, a source for students to come and putting knowledge out there. I think a university can actually be uh, an institution that can build social cohesion and social solidarity through the work that it does by reaching out to communities, and we have it here. And I've met many people this morning outside of this meeting where Duke's actually doing that, working in partnership in communities, building capacity, building resilience, building prospects for the future, whether it's in medical education, uh, whether it's in research, whether it's actually in service, you're doing it. And too many of our universities are not doing that. So uh, I think the university has a critical role to play in responding to that dispossession and alienation. Yes. Microphone here. I'm Jennifer Potts with Innovations in Healthcare. Could you talk a little bit about the state of the donor community where interdisciplinary donations are considered? Or not. Considered. Or not. <laughs> and what shall we do? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, I need to um, offer praise where praise is due because uh, um, I found that uh, the Rockefeller Foundation has been fantastically supportive, actually, of interdisciplinary work. Um, but it's true that if I look across um, many of our funding bodies, that's not the case. The Wellcome Trust has been very good at funding some of the work that we've been doing on climate change and health, and indeed has invested in creating a new climate and health unit at uh, University College London that came from a commission on climate change that we did. But other institutions, and uh, it's always dangerous to name them, but there's obviously a big one sitting in Seattle, um, it's tougher, it's tougher. And indeed, I would say that sometimes the, um, the, the silos are accentuated. Let me give you one stupidly trivial but extremely annoying example. <laughs> so we, we launched a series on maternal health two weeks ago. It was a wonderful series. Um, and the, and, and the, uh, the team did a fantastic job. But the, the series came down to a stupid argument in the last 24 hours before we went to press over what the picture was going to be on the front cover of the executive summary. And our view was that a mother doesn't become a mother simply to become a mother. Most mothers want to have a healthy child at the end of it. And so it seemed reasonable to put on the front cover a mother and a child to celebrate the fact that that was the goal of a successful pregnancy. Oh, my God. The roof came down. Uh, we had the communications agency that Gates had hired, um, some people who are working with the authors, although uh, they, they say not themselves, um, ringing up a dozen people at the Lancet saying that we were undermining the series, undermining that campaign for maternal health. This was terrible. We've done series on newborn health in the past. This was the moment to give maternal health community a chance uh, to have its say, to put them in the central uh, place, to give them, the, give them the attention. And why the hell do we have children on the front cover? We spend too much time talking about kids. It's the moment to talk about mothers. And so we ended up launching this thing at the UNGA. The executive summary had a picture of a pregnant woman, which was a beautiful picture. And then the series itself had a picture of a mother and child. And what that tells you is that we've created, we've incentivized these silos where the maternal health community, sorry, doesn't want to work with the newborn health community to the extent that they don't even want a picture of a child on the front of their series. <laughs> How sick is that? <laughs> and who funded it and encouraged it and isn't changing it? There's your answer. Okay. There's a problem. Well, I wish we had more time. Uh... <laughs> I think we're just getting warmed up, Richard. <laughs> but I want to thank you uh, for, for, from everyone here. Um, one way or the other, I've been in the field of global health for close to 50 years, and uh, there's few journals and individuals who have made the difference you've made. <laughs> and uh, you need to keep pushing us uh, to get to new levels. I, you don't need my encouragement. I know you'll do it. <laughs> But I just want to thank you for crossing the Atlantic uh, and coming here today and sharing these thoughts with 
the, the uh, so many young people and uh, others who really are committed to this field. And I, I can assure you, we'll, we will take your words very seriously uh, in our strategic planning, and we'll send you the report. You can give us a report card. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mike. Thank you very much to Richard. Thanks. Here's a small gift, a small gift from Duke. Thanks, Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. That's great. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.